Welcome to worship on the 18th Sunday after Pentecost. You are welcome here. We begin together with confession and forgiveness. O oh God, all hearts are open to you, all desires are known. Together we confess, have mercy, O oh God, for against you we have sinned. In your compassion, cleanse us from our sin and take away our guilt. Create in us a new heart and give us a steadfast spirit. Do not cast us away, but fill us with the Holy Spirit and restore your joy within us. By the mercy of God, we are united with Jesus Christ, in whom we are forgiven. We rest now in the peace of Christ and rise in the morning to serve. Alleluia. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Praise the name. 
three years, we've done this thing called 10 for 10. And we talk about a lot about 10 for 10, but the reality is it's based in talking about mental health and breaking the silence around it. And it started with conversations had with youth. And something really cool happened this week. We had the opportunity to go to a synod-wide youth event called Alive and ask youth and have conversations with them around mental health. So we asked them this question. How do you show yourself grace when you don't feel okay? I kind of let myself not feel okay because I feel like if you're covering it up, you're not allowing yourself that space to breathe. Just breathe and however negative you feel and whatever negative thoughts you think, they aren't true. Um, what I do a lot of the time is listen to music. I like to move around, so walking around my house, running a little bit. Yeah, just kind of relieving stress a little bit. Um, I usually go to someone and ask to talk to them about it. Um, I usually cry about it, make myself comfortable, and listen to music. I just take a second and breathe in and breathe out and just think about it and just collect my thoughts. And that's how I show myself grace, is just to take a second and pause and think about it. I show myself grace by just loving myself and not being too hard on myself. I show myself grace by just giving myself a, a breather, you know, taking a, a nice uh, break, giving myself like a glass of water maybe, and just cooling off and, uh, you know, putting everything into perspective. I take some me time and regain my confidence through just being bold in my inner thoughts and saying what I'm going to do, even though they might never happen, I feel like regaining my own confidence in my head is what makes me move forward. Hi. Today's reading is from 2 Kings, chapter 5, verses 1 through 3 and 7 through 15c. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man and in high favor with his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man, though a mighty warrior, suffered from leprosy. Now, the Arameans, on one of their raids, had taken a young girl captive from the land of Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my lord were with the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to give death or life, that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Just look and see how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a message to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me, that he may learn that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the entrance of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go, wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored and you shall be clean. But Naaman became angry and went away, saying, I thought that for me he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, and would wave his hand over the spot and cure the leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? He turned and went away in a rage. But his servants approached and said to him, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more when all he said to you was, Wash and be clean. So he went down and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. His flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy, and he was clean. Then he returned to the man of God. He and all his company, he, he came and stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel from this morning is from the book of Luke, chapter 17, beginning at verse 11. 
On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, 10 lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out saying, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, were not 10 made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, get up, and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today we heard two stories, both about healings, miraculous healings. Both are healings from the disease of leprosy, and both prominently feature outsiders, non-Jewish main characters. So first we read today a story in the book of 2 Kings that takes place in ancient Israel during the reign of Jehoram. Now, remember, 2 Kings is a book, it's a history being written after Israel's return from the Babylonian exile, trying to examine and make sense of the events leading up to the captivity. Well, our story goes that this very important and very well-connected commander of the army of Aram, while powerful, was afflicted with the disease of leprosy. Now, during one of their raids of Israel, the army had captured a girl who was from Israel, and she now served this, the wife of this commander. Now, the girl tells Naaman's wife that there's a prophet in the court of Israel who can cure him. So Naaman goes to his king, who encourages him to go to Israel to be healed. Now the king of Aram then writes a letter to the king of Israel as sort of an introduction for Naaman, asking that he could he come and be healed of his leprosy. Now the king of Israel reads this letter and he thinks that it's a threat. If he doesn't somehow heal this Aramite commander, they will attack him. So he tears his clothes in frustration saying, I'm not God, how am I supposed to cure this man? Well, the prophet in the court of Israel, Elisha, who the girl was talking about all along, hears of this and he says, let him come to me so that he may see that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman goes with all of his fancy entourage to Elisha's house. This is sort of a lowly place for a man like this to go, right? He's this powerful army commander. And we hear that Elisha sends a messenger to tell Naaman to go and wash in the Jordan River seven times and he will be healed. Now, instead of being excited to be healed, Naaman is furious, right? How dare a commoner like Elisha not come out, bow to me, meet with me personally? How dare he just send a messenger to someone so powerful and wash in some dumb river? What nonsense! The prophet should come out and do some fancy curing magical spells and heal me. I have proper rivers to wash in back home if that was all there was to it. Why did I come all the way here for some messenger to tell me to bathe in their river? Well, he turns and he leaves in a rage. But his servant catches up with him and says, Father, if he would have told you to do something complicated, you would have done it, right? So... Why not try this really simple thing, bathing in the river? So Naaman goes to the Jordan and dunks in seven times, after which we hear his skin is as soft and new as that of a young child. Naaman goes to Elisha. This time, Elisha will see him personally. And he says, now I know there is no God but the God of Israel. He offers Elisha gifts, calls himself Elisha's servant. He has come back to say thank you. Then in our gospel story, in a village on the road to Jerusalem, Jesus cures 10 people 
with the same thing, with leprosy. But only one of them returns in gratitude, praising God. And like Naaman, this man is also an outsider. In Jesus' time, one of the worst kinds of outsiders, a Samaritan. So now the thing to keep in mind in these healing stories is that they both cure leprosy, right? Now, leprosy in both the Old and the New Testaments, it's not the disease that we know now as leprosy or Hansen's disease. It's basically any and all skin diseases, skin disorders, any of those things that existed in the ancient world. One skin problem is more or less the same as the next. And for ancient people who didn't necessarily understand the causes of disease and often lacked effective cures for disease, something seen as contagious, like a skin condition, would be treated by shunning the affected person, right? Removing them from society, isolating them somewhere where so-called normal people wouldn't come close to them and risk a contact spread. The thing about skin disease, not true for all diseases, is that right, it's on your skin, your most visible organ. People with heart disease or intestinal maladies weren't so likely to be shunned. Their problems were maybe more dangerous, but invisible, not so obvious. So in the ancient world, stuff going wrong with your skin often meant exile. You you couldn't live with your family anymore. You couldn't see your friends. You had to go live on your own or with other people who also had skin diseases. You were cut off, rejected, discarded. And in both of our stories today, God, through Elisha, and then Jesus, the Christ, sees the suffering of this isolation, of this rejection, and acts to restore relationship. Naaman with his king and his kinsmen, and the lepers with their temple, their priest, and the rest of the Jewish people. A couple of things stood out to me in these healing stories. First, Naaman, right, he's so powerful and he's such an important person that he is expecting an equally powerful and important healing. A healing befitting a man of his station, right? He came to Elisha with all these horses and chariots, right, that people of power would have traveled with back then. You could imagine it as sort of like an ancient circus parade, right? And he comes to Elisha's house and he wants him to come out and do something grand, shout to God, wave his hands, and heal with a whole performance worthy of such a powerful person. But Elisha doesn't even see him. He sends a messenger to tell him to wash in the river, not fancy or magical or anything. But except for his servants who convince him to give the bathing a try, he would have left without any healing because he was expecting a different kind of miracle than the miracle that he got. And I understand that. It's easy to discount the little miracles. It's easy to forget about them, to take the little healings for granted. The restorations and the reconciliations that don't make headlines, they don't go viral, they don't dominate your feed. In fact, it's easy to miss them altogether and allow our worldview to be dominated by all the terrible things that happen everywhere, every day as we are so saturated in the culture of the dramatic, the sensationalist worship of the spectacle, we forget that it is faith, hope, and love that abide. These three. They might be the only things that last, but they are definitely not always the loudest or the flashiest or the most attention-grabbing and exciting. Sometimes, like for Naaman, What is healing is simple. It's quiet. It's modest. It's slow. We read that Naaman doesn't take one dip in the river. He has to take seven. 
And the lepers on the road aren't healed in an instant, the passage reads, and it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. Just like Elisha, no clap of thunder or flash of glitter and smoke, no roar of the crowd. Instead, quiet, slow, modest. So quiet, slow, and modest that we can miss them. And when we stop believing in those quiet little miracles, the good that happens every day, we become the lepers separated from each other by suspicion and conspiracy and cynicism, we begin to believe that maybe God is done with us, done with the healing, done with the connecting and the reconciling. And if God is done healing, we are surely lost. When I was in seminary, I took a trip to France and Germany and Switzerland. For part of that trip, I was in the Tizé Monastery in France. But for a whole week before that, I was in Geneva and Strasbourg. Well, in Strasbourg in particular, there's a place called the Institute for Ecumenical Research. Not a name that jumps out as thrilling, uh, not not a hot travel destination, right? But in that plain, an inauspicious house, Once the headquarters for the Gestapo in Strasbourg, God has been hard at work, slowly, quietly, diligently, performing a miracle. The staff of the Institute, sponsored by Lutheran World Federation, has been working for many years with the Roman Catholic Church. And in 1999, signed what's called the Joint Declaration of the Doctrine of Justification. Again, the title alone, alone, I get it. Let's put it this way, the report didn't actually fly off the shelves. It was never a bestseller. But did you know that with the signing of this document, one of the key conflicts of the Reformation was resolved? Initially a Catholic and Lutheran agreement, it has since been joined and affirmed by other Christian communities, Methodist, Anglican, Reformed. In fact, when the Pope observed the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, instead of a green stole, the correct color for the church calendar, he wore red, the color of the Reformation. The Lutheran and the Roman Catholic Church, now almost 20 years later, are actually nearing reconciliation, nearing agreement, not the same, but in communion with each other, something that even 60 years ago would have been absolutely, utterly, obviously impossible. But quietly, little by little, slowly and bit by bit, these two former enemies are healing coming back together, talking, connecting, reconciling, like two old friends separated by a long ago conflict, realizing they actually have much more in common than they remembered they did. You see, God is not done. And like that Samaritan, I say thanks be to God, the holy, the faithful, the loving and gracious one, for we are not alone in chaos. We are not abandoned to the whims and the waves. It might be quiet. It might be slow. But with us and through us and around and above and in between, all that is God, the Holy Spirit, is working miracles for the healing of the world. Believe so that you may see, see and testify to the healing in the midst of the everyday. God at work. Alleluia and amen. Forgiven love
loved and free the life of Jesus to recall in love laid down for me in love laid down for me I come with Christians far and near to find the soul of it the new community of love in Christ communion bread in Christ communion bread as Christ breaks bread and bids us share each proud division ends the love that made us makes us one and strangers now are friends and strangers now are friends The Spirit of the risen Christ, unseen but ever near, is in such friendship better known, alive among us here, alive among us here. Together met, together bound, by all that God has done. Hello and welcome. We're so glad to have you with us here today. I have just a couple of quick announcements for you. The first is that David Huntsman will be in concert here at the church on October 14th. It's coming up this coming Friday. If you haven't gotten your tickets yet, uh, I want to invite you to head on over to the music page of our website where you can purchase tickets. Otherwise, we will be selling tickets at the door. It's going to be a beautiful night of music with David and a couple of other guest musicians, and we really hope to see you there. Uh, next, we have a fall festival coming up for October 20th. 23rd. That's from three until five. It's going to be a fun afternoon of games and crafts, pumpkin painting, all kinds of different activities for the kids. All are welcome. Bring your friends, neighbors, whoever, and we hope to see you there as well. Next is another video in our giving season. But before we do that, we are reminded that God's purpose for St. Luke's is to connect, serve, and grow in Christ's love. My wife, Carrie, and I and our four children, we've been coming to St. Luke's since 2012, and we are 11 o'clockers. I typically go to the 8 o'clock. I alternate between the 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock services. Oh, Oasis is a place where I get to commune with the divine. Um, uh, music speaks to my soul. At first we came because we heard that this was a place with great music, and then we thought about exploring other places, and our kids said, no, this is our church. But what started as a Sunday morning thing in our lives has now grown into children's choir and youth ministry activities and family events. They step up and help the community in so many ways. That has probably more meaning to me than it might to a lot of people, but it, it really does matter. I keep coming back for the people. The, my dirty little secret, and I'll tell you just because we're talking here, is that we're not actually members. We, we've been coming here I, I probably more religiously, quote unquote, than churches that I belong to. I love to sing with the choir and sing God's praises and be in fellowship. I've been involved in Grief Share. I've been a Stephen minister. I try to find a variety of ways to help. I really appreciate the fact that St. Luke's recognizes not only financial contributions, but also time and talent contributions. So I am giving electronically. I have it set up. My giving is uh, budgeted and uh, it is done and uh, automatically. Sometimes I throw in another check to make sure that the uh, ministries get a little extra help too. Um, I've done all of the above. Uh, for whatever reason, um, it's easier for me to do it in the collection plate as I walk in. I, I would encourage people to give electronically so they don't think about it, so that it doesn't become a thing. It's not a budget item. It's, it's the right thing to do because this ministry rocks. We give at a regular frequency and we do it electronically. Those things come at some level of cost and I appreciate the talented staff we have to support and offer the things that our church does. It's an, it's an important part of being part of a community 
and being an active part is to give of whatever means you have. I believe that by giving to others, I am sharing the love that God has for me. I can't think of a better way to use what I have than being able to share it with other people. We come together now to pray. In gratitude and humility, let us join together in prayer on behalf of all God's creation. Gracious God, we give you thanks for bishops, pastors, and deacons. Inspire leaders of the church to proclaim your mighty deeds, that your saving faith may be known to all. Majestic God, we give you thanks for land and water, seed time and harvest. Break down boundaries we construct between ourselves and the rest of your creation. Bring renewal and restoration to places affected by pollution and deforestation. Mighty God, we give you thanks for those in our community, nation, and world who work for justice and peace. Guide those who govern to act on behalf of those marginalized by race, ethnicity, or religion. Merciful God, we give you thanks for you hear the cries of those in need. Restore to community those who are stigmatized by illness, feel rejected, or live in isolation. May you send healing to all who suffer. Faithful God, we give you thanks for the healing ministries of this congregation. Equip those who visit, care, and pray for the sick. Give insight to doctors, nurses, home health aides, and all practitioners of medical arts. Today, we lift up these members of St. Luke's, Katie and Andrew Larocque, Kelvin and Tyson, Mark and Brenda Larson, Josh, Jordan, and Alyssa, Brandon Laufenberg, Marin Laufenberg, Marita Laufenberg, Kirsten, and Brian, John and Sarah Laurent, Grant, Jacob, Mark, and Maria. We lift up Gary and Tammy Ladine, Philip, Daniel, and Emily, and Lauren Ladine. We lift these names and those on our hearts to you, O Lord trusting in your everlasting and never-ending love. Eternal God, we give you thanks for your faithful people who have gone before us to your glory. Renew our trust in your eternal promises of mercy, redemption, and new life. With grateful hearts, we commend our spoken and silent prayers to you as we pray the words that Jesus had taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you. May the Lord give you mercy and peace now and forever. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Hey, thank you for joining us. If you would like to support the ministries at St. Luke's, you can make an offering online at stlukes-elca.org backslash give. We want to offer a huge thank you to all for your continued support. If you're in the Middleton area and would like to join us in person, we gather every Sunday morning. And you can find our full worship schedule on the website as well. If you're just finding us for the first time, welcome. Let us know you're here by filling out the Connect card in the links below. Thank you for worshiping with us.